Hey everybody, welcome back. Uh, we are in the Flip Flopperator Auditorium, and up next we have Jeremy Rothstein. Uh, Jeremy Rothstein is a systems engineer with a background in industrial control systems, uh, and he has been running the show all day here in the Flip Flopperator Auditorium. So even though you haven't you haven't uh, seen him yet, you have felt his presence, um, and now he is actually going to give a talk directly. So for for the first time, he's going to be in the limelight. So um, thank you very much. Take it away, Jeremy. No worries. Thanks, uh, Tom. Yeah, I'm used to being behind the curtain. Um, so yeah, certainly feels a little bit weird uh, being on the other side, uh, intentionally, uh, at least. Um, so the name of the guy in this uh, picture is Alex Martelli. Um, he's authored several well-known books on Python. Um, if you haven't read his books, you've probably seen something of his on Stack Overflow where he's got a pretty high karma score, as you can see. Um, in one of his posts, he called Qs the secret source of C Python threading. Um, now, what the hell did he mean by that? Before I answer that question, let's go through a little background about how queues work. Um, queues are used for communicating internally uh, between different tasks of the application that are running at the same time without locking up the entire application, waiting for messages to be sent or received. So in this example here, I'm using async IO queues, um, but in synchronous land, uh, there's a similar queue primitive for communicating between threads. So if you're not up to speed with the whole async IO concept, um, in this example and the ones that follow, um, just replace in your head async IO task with thread. Um, there's also a queue concept for communic communicating across processes, um, which I won't get into here. Um, so on the left, you can see we create the queue in one task. Um, that's the publisher side. Um, and put a message in the queue, hello world. Um, in, in Python, there can be many publishers um, to a queue, um, but in general, only one consumer of a, of a queue's message out of the box. Um, in another task, in async IO language, um, we wait for a new message to be available on the queue. Um, so the, the task two coroutine, um, which we're, we're calling the subscriber, um, is blocked while waiting for a new message. Um, but task one and any other tasks are still able to execute. Um, this is a photo taken at the Mozilla offices, uh, I believe. Um, let's do a little bit of enhancement. You would think... Uh, they of all people would know uh, a little about the inherent dangers of writing multi-threaded code. Uh, the problem with multi-threaded code is locking down mutable shared resources or resources that can only be used by one task at a time. The solution normally is to serialize access to shared resources using locks, um, preventing any other tasks using the shared resource until the current user of the resource releases the lock. Um, a common shared resource that often needs protecting is a connection object, uh, say, from a database, um, although modern libraries often do the, the heavy lifting for you uh, these days. But the problem with that is you have to remember to use the lock everywhere the con object is required because that con object is available to all threads at all times. So the need to sprinkle locks everywhere throughout your code might be fine for smaller code bases, but is fiendishly difficult to get right all the time um, and can lead to hard to track down bugs and deadlocks, which I guess is why Mozilla put that sign up. You may be thinking, oh, what about using async IO? Isn't that single threaded so it gets around the problem? We're done, right? Uh, no. <laughs> um, even though I've written it in large red font, um, it's actually a subtle point, I think. Um, yes, the async IO event loop runs in one thread only and eliminates a certain class of problems uh, present in multi threading, uh, but you can still introduce race conditions uh, just at the application level 
in asyncio land very very easily but if the libraries are using a, a well-designed and able to hook into the event loop then yes you can just use the shared resource concurrently across multiple async io tasks but even then sometimes you just you don't trust that an async io library that you're using is safe from task-based race conditions or you just want to bring some order to your async io application or sometimes you you really need or want to use a library that is not async io friendly and needs to be run in a separate thread uh, called an executor uh, to keep the async io event loop fast um, some well-known examples uh, of these libraries are uh, sql alchemy and and requests for example so with that in mind uh the real i guess secret source that Alex was hinting at in the earlier slide is to use queues to serialize, or in other words, funnel requests that require the shared resource um, into a handler that processes the requests one by one uh, sequentially for that shared resource. The really cool thing about this example uh, is that that dangerous con object we're calling it that can only be safely be used by one task at a time is defined inside the handle requests uh, task, which means it doesn't exist outside it, which means there's zero possibility of it being used elsewhere at the same time by other tasks and causing nasty issues. So you're making a request using an internal API on the left side, um, that's that query comma fute uh, tuple. And the task or the coroutine is processing your request um, that's the handle handle requests uh, task and returning you a result. So kind of like a HTTP request response architecture um, that you're probably familiar with. And as I said, uh, con is confined inside that long running handle request black box, nice and safe. So this this approach generally scales better um, for larger code bases that than locks. Um, and I think it's it's easier to reason about as well. Hope you do too. Uh, the next killer app of queues that I want to talk about is for internal event dispatching. Um, so for larger asynchronous applications, it can often be a, a really good idea to have an internal event bus where different tasks can publish events and subscribe to events. An event bus is it's just a fancy name for something that sits in the middle and coordinates communication between multiple publishers and multiple subscribers. It's a way of turning queues, which we, we saw a bit in the previous example, um, as a, a many-to-one solution out of the box into a many-to-many a -many solution. Um, in this example, we've got a queue that all the events get published to. Uh, that's the event underscore queue uh, thing in the middle. Um, and the messages being published contain a color and an object of that color on the left. So you can see we've got some publishers publishing red events, so we've got some publishers publishing green events, and on the subscriber side, uh, we've got individual queues for each event type a subscriber wants to listen to. So different, different to the, the global event queue. Uh, we've got subscribers listening for red events, uh, green events, and we've even got one subscriber that's listening for red and green events, hence those, those two listening queues you see there in the middle. Um, just in this, as an aside as well, um, one of the main, uh, I guess, complicating factors that you, you need to consider when using this type of architecture is that it does make debugging much harder. Um, and, and the reason we, is that the event bus gets in the way, basically, um, of being to trace all the way back to the original source of the message. So if a, a subscriber throws an exception, um, you, you have trouble finding the originating publisher. So the way around it, how I normally do it, is just to have really good logging um, of all the messages coming into the event queue and their source and all the messages going out um, and where, where their destination is. That's normally good enough, but th there's some other methods um, I can get to after the talk as well. Um, 
Here's, here's a really simple implementation of an event bus. Um, you can see I've set a long running task because it's running in, a, in an infinite loop and it's listening for events. Um, it's reading the event type of the message and then gets all the individual subscriber queues um, for that event type and simply publishes the event to each subscribe queue sequentially. For graceful shutdowns, we've got a sentinel message called shutdown, which causes the task to break out of the loop and exit. You can set it up to send that uh, shutdown message to the event queue when the user presses uh, control C, for example. Uh, so nice graceful shutdown. That's it. That's that's an event bus. Um, not too scary, I hope. Um, here's an example of how you actually publish a message to that event uh, event queue. As you can see, uh, the event is represented as a dictionary, although I probably use an immutable data structure for peace of mind, um, with the event name acting as uh, the key. On the subscriber side, this is a slightly different example to the, the green and red. Um, yeah, we're, we're modeling a, uh, a restaurant's kitchen um, that receives requests from front of house to make meals or perform other kitchen related work. So as you, see, as you can see, um, we've got a context manager um, that returns an object with a list of subscribers that are listening for the order up or the shutdown events. Um, the context manager uh, handles any unsubscribing or subscribing work um, that needs to be done. Um, now we're using this fancy async IO for loop uh, thing, uh, which allows us to loop through events as they come in um, without blocking um, the, the event loop. The actual work being performed is just to make the secret source. And to handle graceful shutdowns, uh, when the shutdown message is received, or if you look above that red box, um, I've got an eight hours uh, constant there. Um, either case, um, it will uh, break out of that loop and say kitchen is closed. So that's how you handle it for graceful shutdown. So that's basically uh, what I wanted to talk about with queues. In summary, um, queues are really general purpose. You can use them for lots and lots of different things, um, mainly communicating between different concurrent activities, uh, which surprise, surprise, is basically the real, how the real world works. Um, and yeah, the two main killer apps that I want you to remember um, from this talk, uh, serializing access to dangerous objects um, and using queues to implement uh, event bus uh, arch architecture, that many to what many um, architecture where you've got multiple publishers and multiple subscribers. So that's about it. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Um, I feel like queues are one of those things that unless you do a lot of multiprocessing work, you forget they exist, and then you end up inventing a terrible version of it yourself. So for someone, I've, I've spent a lot of my time avoiding multiprocessing precisely because I know it's hard. And so when I do find myself doing it and find myself rediscovering queues, I'm like, oh, thank goodness this already exists because... Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I only use them pretty much exclusively for inside a, an application or a process. I, I never really use it for communicating between processes. I, I typically use something like Redis um, for for providing that that event bus architecture in in, in a platform independent way. Um, yeah. So yeah, that, that's how I approach it. Cool. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Uh, we now have an extended break. We will be resuming at 4 p.m. Adelaide time. Uh, so take a break. Have a couple coffees. How many have you already had today? Um, and we will see you again soon. See you later, everybody. <laughs>